Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Well, we are finishing up a series that we started some time ago on the armor of the believer. We spent some time talking about angels, about demons, about our authority over these demons. And now we talked about the equipment. What, what equipment do we have? What resources do we have to defeat the enemy? And so Paul in Ephesians 6 outlines for us the imagery of a Roman soldier, and he compares this to things in our Christian lives. Now, when he begins in verse uh, 14, he says, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. What does the belt of truth mean? All right. All right, so when we talk about the belt of truth, what is Paul talking about here? Okay, that's what normally. But the word is used here is a word that means truthfulness or sincerity. And it talks about how we have to be honest with ourselves about this battle. Hello? The beginning stages is are we really in a battle or not? Is there a battle going on? There's a battle going on, but are we really involved? So that's the belt of truth. And then he says, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. What is that? The breastplate of righteousness is the understanding and the firm commitment to the fact that the righteousness of Jesus Christ becomes mine at the time of salvation. Amen. And so I am standing before God in the righteous standing of Jesus himself. Amen. What an awesome thought that is. That Jesus took my sins upon himself, gave me his innocence, and I stand before God today... In fact, if God were to look at his book of, of deeds, and he would turn to the page for, let's say, Michael Fair, because Michael is a child of God, that page is completely blank. Now, we know, we know the real Michael. We know that isn't true. My page is wrong. Well, I didn't want to say that, honey, but I, I you know. Don't let him go. But the point is, our, our standing before God is not because of who I am, it's because of who he is. Amen. So he's just taking on the belt of truth, that's being honest with ourselves, that there's a battle going on, the taking up the shield of, or the uh, breastplate of righteousness, the understanding that I am standing in the righteousness of Christ. And then he says, having your feet shod with the readiness that is given by the gospel of peace. The feet... The shoes were so important to the Roman soldiers because it gave them footing. It gives them a foundation. And this refers to the fact that we have a foundation of peace because we know we are right with God. And then he says, taking up the shield of faith. And that one, I think, is very explanatory. We have, a, we have faith that God has given us that we have to mature, we have to grow. In fact, Romans 14 says we have been, each of us have been given a measure of faith. 
But what do we do with that faith that God has given us? Do we grow it? Do we exercise it? Do we increase it? And that's what we need to be doing. And he says, and the sheath, the, excuse me, the helmet of salvation. Now people want to say that refers to our salvation. Well, yes and no. It does in the sense, but it refers to the future fulfillment of all of our salvation. The covenant of salvation means we look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ and we receive in full all that God has already promised us. Hello? Okay. And then he says, and the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? It's the word of God. Amen. So the last one in this, by the way, and some people think there's only six of these pieces of equipment, but I don't think God usually works in sixes. God usually uses sevens or threes. But there is one other thing listed in verse 18. He says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. So there is one other piece of equipment which seems to be directly related to the armor, and that is prayer. Not very important, of course. We got to think about prayer. Now, this, of course, was a humorous thing. It wasn't a, a serious matter. But prayer. Remember, Jesus is the one that taught us to pray, "Deliver us from the evil one." Now, evil in the text there is a, an adjective representing it. Rep, it modifies something. It's not specified. So the word "one" has been placed in there. We know what it's talking about. Deliver us from the evil one. Who is that? Satan. 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 Now, as we come to this text in Ephesians 6, verse 18, one of the things I do when I'm preparing a lesson is to go through and make up an outline. And this, this verse just falls right into a natural outline, so I want you to follow there with me. Look what he says in verse, look what he says in verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit... With all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. Stop reading at that point. So here's the outline. First of all, first of all, he talks about the frequency. How much are we supposed to pray every night? Before, before we eat a meal, we're supposed to pray, right? Yes, sir. And that's it? No, that's it. Oh, oh, oh. That's not all of it, though. How much are we to pray? How much? All the time. So, you want to drive me down by my head and try to. No. What? Oh, it's about my head. I see. Look, here's some translations of that verse in some other translations. God's Word translation says, pray in the Spirit in every situation. Very clear, isn't it? Plenty of situations. Yes. And we have situations every day. The Good News Bible, or the Living Bible, says, pray on every occasion as the Spirit leads. So how often are we to pray? Every occasion. Everything that happens. The Amplified Bible says, pray at all times, and they define that as being on every occasion or in every season. So how often are we to pray? At all times. The International Standard Version says, pray in the Spirit at all times. The New Living Translation says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. There's no way to get around the idea here. How often are we to pray? Every day, every moment, every second that we're living, we're to be in an attitude of prayer. It reminds me in the Old Testament, before the curtain going into the holy, the most holy place, or the Holy of Holies, there was an altar of incense, and God had instructed in the Old Testament that there was to be continual offering of incense on that altar because as the smoke of that incense arose, it represented the prayers of the saints. So how often will they put incense on it? Every day. So it was continually, continual, continual prayer going up. 
How about these verses? Romans 12, 2. Somebody read? No, 12, 12, excuse me. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Be what? Constant. constant. We have problems being constant, don't we? Yeah. Another one. Colossians 4, 2. Somebody read this? Continue steadfast in prayer, be watchful in it with thanksgiving. Okay, but he says continue steadfast. In Philippians 4, Paul says, do, it. do not be anxious. You know that's a command in the scriptures? Yes. So when we become anxious, we're disobedient. But he says, do not be anxious about most things. <clears throat> Any what? Anything. But in everything. Notice what he uses those, those polar opposites. Anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A wonderful promise in that verse that when we pray about everything, God's peace will stand guard over our hearts. Amen. Is that what the world's after today? The peace? Yeah. Exactly right. And one other verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Somebody, okay? You got to say it out loud. So in this verse, how are we to pray? He says, pray without sneezing. Oh, oh, oh I mean, no, no, ceasing. <laughs> we used to, as kids, sometimes joke about that being praying without sneezing. But we're to pray without ceasing. Which means what? Always. Put it in. What'd you say, babe? You can do it in your mind, too. Exactly right. Exactly right. I right. Do it a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah, I agree. That's really the only way I can do it. Like yes. And then, like I was joking a while ago, but when you're driving the car, you don't have to close your eyes. No, the Bible doesn't say you have to close your eyes when you pray. Now, why do we close our eyes? Yeah, keep away distractions. Of course, none of us are easily distracted, are we? <laughs> anyway. All right. Prayer. We're called to be prayer warriors. Amen. So I'm questioning, why is it that we don't pray more? Lazy. Lazy. We're distracted. Exactly. Yeah, we're yeah. Distracted by the things of the world sometimes. Yeah. Well, I came up with three things. I put number one, we have never been taught or have learned how to pray properly and constant or consistently. Hmm? I remember as a kid, my mom and dad would sometimes bring us boys in and we would have prayer times. And all oh, we would sit there and fidget and fuss and twist and turn and, and mom and dad would go on praying. And, oh. <laughs> and let me say, this is not the way to teach kids how to pray. <laughs> it, brought a, it brought a resentment in my heart for extended times of prayer. So how are we to pray? Well, we need to be taught. Remember the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray? Because as they heard Jesus pray, they realized their prayers were, were so much less. So we need to be taught, and sometimes we need to spend time learning how to pray properly and how to pray consistently. Number two, as I put down, we don't make it a priority in our lives. Should we make it a priority? I think without a doubt we should. And what about this one? We sometimes have more confidence in ourselves than we do in God. And so this, this is not a good thing for us either. We need to make sure we're putting the God in his proper place. And I, one other thought I had in my notes here is or we don't feel like we need God. <laughs> now we would never admit that, but that's sometimes the way our attitudes, our actions 
portray. I heard a story once, I read a story about D.L. Moody was holding a, and he was a big evangelist, and was holding a meeting somewhere, and they came to a point he called on a man to pray. And this man began to pray about this situation there, and the missionaries over here, and the missionary. And finally, D.L. Moody got up in the middle of the guy's prayer and said, All right, while he finishes his prayer, let's turn to page so and so and sing this, this song. <laughs> that wasn't the right time for that kind of prayer. That was your closet prayer. Yes. And so many times, you, 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 in a lot of church services, even today, you'll find people get up and they'll just, it kind of expresses and kind of shows that they haven't been praying on their own at home and they're trying to put on a big display in their church time. Here's what Tony Evans had to say about prayer. Anybody who's serious about prayer can tell you that real prayer is hard work. Why is that? He said, because this is war, Satan doesn't want you to do any praying at all. So could our lack of prayer actually be a form of spiritual warfare? I kind of think so, yes. So that has to do with the frequency of prayer. What's the next thing in this verse? I like this little picture too. The variety of prayer. We're supposed to be praying with all prayer and all supplication. In fact, notice in verse 18 how many times the word all appears. He says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and for me. Four. Yeah. Hey, you're, <laughs> you're a good counter, man. You need to become a CPA one of these days. So my next point was, what does prayer and supplication mean? Oh, no, no volunteer? Supplication is not supper, right? <laughs> no, not the same thing. The word prayer that as he uses here is the very common word for prayer. It's prosuke, and it's a very general word for prayer. But when he comes to the word supplication, a different word entirely, and it comes from a word, a root word that means to beg. To beg. So there are times that we spend in prayer, our daily prayer, the different kind of things, and that would be prayer, prosuke. But then there are those moments when we get into an intensity of our prayer life, when our prayer takes on great meaning and we're in, in desperate straits, and as we're praying to the Lord, we get into the area of supplication. In fact, the same word is used in Luke chapter 1 when the angel appears to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, remember? And he was a priest, actually, yeah, a priest in the, the uh, temple. And it happened to be his time, they would, by lots, they would choose who had the privilege of offering the incense on the altar of incense. And he was offering this, and you can imagine, all the years he had been in, in the priesthood, this had never been his, his chance. Now his day came, and as he's offering the incense, an angel appears to him, remember? And the angel says to him this, Your prayer has been heard. Now the word he uses for prayer is the same word used for supplication in the, our text today. This idea of begging the intensity of prayer. Well, what is it that Zechariah had been praying about? He wanted a child. And the angel comes and says, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your begging, your pleading, your asking has been heard. And we know that a few months later, his wife gave birth to a son whose name was John. Here's what one other pastor says. So Paul is just calling us to pray for all different types of requests and needs, general and specific. To put it simply, Paul says that spiritual warfare prayer means that we have to pray for things. Wow, interesting. Have you ever heard someone say, I can't ever pray for my own needs? I've heard people say this. Yeah, I have too. It's almost a, a false religious idea, you know, this false religiosity that I can't pray for myself, I've got to pray for everybody else. 
It's interesting because in the model prayer, Jesus taught us to pray for our daily bread. Deliver us from the evil one and he goes through all these things. So yes, there are times that we do need to pray for ourselves. Now, I think so many times we spend too much time praying for ourselves. In fact, here's another idea that David Guzik says. The idea, the idea is all kinds of prayer or prayer upon prayer. When you say prayer and supplication, it's kind of like saying prayer upon prayer, more prayer. He says we should always, excuse me, we should use every kind of prayer we can think of. Group prayer, individual prayer, silent prayer, shouting prayer. Uh, just don't do those this morning, okay? <laughs> Walking prayer, kneeling prayer, eloquent prayer, groaning prayer, constant prayer, fervent prayer. Just pray. But the other thing Paul mentions in this verse in, in Ephesians 6.18 is also we're to pray in the Spirit. Oh, interesting. What does that mean? In fact, I was thinking as I was preparing this, and I meant to go back, and there's a verse in Luke where a man runs in before Jesus, asking him to heal his son, and he falls down before him. And the word in the Greek there is a word that means to, to act like a dog licking the hand of his master. Now, I thought, boy, how graphic that, that imagery is when you think about going before the Lord with our prayer requests, with our heart needs. Yeah. But praying in the Spirit, what does it mean? It can refer to praying in tongues. I don't think that's the only thing this means. But in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talks about how we can pray in tongues. And he says, when I pray in tongues, he said, my mind is unfruitful. I don't know what I'm saying. It's, it's beyond me. But also in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, Paul says that the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers with groanings which cannot be uttered. I mean, just unspeakable things, but the Holy Spirit is able to bring these things out for us. Now, here's Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. There are times that, have you ever been this way, that you can't even put into words what, what's on your heart? Those are the moments that the Holy Spirit can step in and he's able to take those feelings, those ideas, and those hurts and be able to take them to the Lord and make intercession for us. In fact, Dave Guzik says again, the Holy Spirit may help us pray by giving us the right words to say when we pray. He may speak through groanings which cannot be uttered, Romans 8, 26. Or the Holy Spirit may do it through the gift of tongues, a gift God is God gives to seeking hearts which want to communicate with them on a deeper level than normal conversation. So praying in the Spirit can refer to being praying in tongues. It can refer to those moments when you get into intense prayer and the Holy Spirit just kind of takes over and begins to intercede before the Father on your behalf. So variety in our prayers. Praying of prayers and supplication. Praying in the Spirit. These are all kinds of ways that we can pray. But then he mentions this. The manner in which we're to pray is with all perseverance. What's perseverance? Not giving up. That's a good way to put it. Not quitting. Can I say it again? Most of us are not good at perseverance. We quit much too easily. The fourth part of what he's talking about here is just to keep on praying. Keep on praying. Pray and pray and keep on praying. Now, does this mean that God is the kind of a God that only answers our prayer when we have asked him so many times for a certain thing? That he keeps a tab and says, oh, you haven't prayed enough yet. We've got to pray another 15 or 30 times. No. Like some people try to promote this kind of an idea that we're just to badger God with all of our problems, with all of our needs. And in order to justify what they think, they use the story of the unjust judge in Luke chapter 18. And the Bible tells the story of a widow woman who needed to be avenged. And she went to the, this judge. And the Bible says he was a, an evil person that didn't have regard for God or man. 
He didn't care about anybody else but himself. And this woman comes and needs and just keeps at him, keeps asking him, keep asking him to take care of her situation. And finally, he says, boy, just get rid of this woman. I'll do it. Now, some people think that's the way we do with God. And they use that story to say that's what we're to be doing. We're to just to wear God down. And he's you know, resistant to our requests. So you have to keep begging and begging and begging him to find you wear his resistance down. And finally, he'll give you what you need. What you want. Yeah, well, what you want, yeah. Do you really think that God is like that unjust judge? I don't. My God's a loving God who knows what I need before I even ask him. So it is not that that story is saying we're to wear down God like the unjust judge was. All that Jesus is saying in that story is just don't quit. That's what that, that widow woman, she just wouldn't give up. And that's the story we need to keep in mind, that we need to persevere. You remember in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, Daniel had been praying about a vision that God had given him, and he didn't understand some things about it, so he prayed for understanding of this vision. And he says that 21 days later, he's out by the, the river, and this man appears, of course we know it now it's an angel, but this man appears and he tells him that from the very moment he prayed, God heard his prayer. But as he was dispatched to come and bring the, the message to Daniel, he says he was stopped by the prince of Persia. And he was held for 21 days, and he couldn't bring the, the, the message to Daniel. By the way, the prince of Persia is almost certainly a demon, an evil force. And this demon... In fact, the, the angel that was talking to, to Daniel said that Michael came and fought against the demon so he could get through to go ahead and get the message to Daniel. But 21 days, Daniel had to pray before he ever got a, an answer to what he was praying about. So how often do we give up? When do we quit? Yeah. I think there can come times. And I, I agree with you. Kathy said never. But I think there can be times in certain times of prayer that God says, okay, you know, enough. I mean, your, your prayer's been heard, but the answer's dependent upon what someone else feels, how they're thinking, and so forth. But anyway. I think God, God gives us a release. Yes. When we sit, right? That's yes. The word That's the word I guess I was looking for, the word release. That we can be released from that burden. But it it doesn't always happen right away. Yeah. In fact, here's another quote by Oswald Sanders. He says, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Ooh, kind of interesting. If God's success in life and in this day and time depended upon how much we prayed. Enough said. Yeah. And then the last point in this, the object of our prayers. He says, for all the saints and for me. I, I love Paul's closing statement here. And he says in verse 19, and for me also, that words may be given to me for opening my mouth. <laughs> you ever prayed that God would make you bolder? <laughs> Remember when Paul wrote this, he was already in prison. And he's praying now for boldness? Wow. What an awesome thing. William Barclay says this, I think that often our prayers are too much for ourselves and too little for others. We must learn to pray as much for others and with others as for ourselves. Amen? Amen. I think our very self-centered lives, sometimes we just spend so much time focusing on just me. And God's saying, lift up your eyes and look out. There's needs all around. And God will work as the people of God pray. 
Ephesians 1, 6, Paul says to the Ephesian church, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That was the whole church of Ephesus. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, Paul says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. You can think of all the things that Paul had on his plate that he could be praying for, but he was faithful to pray for the people in the churches that he had helped establish. Yeah, I agree. I do agree. But maybe that's why his his ministry was such a success. He had that time to pray. I remember reading the story about one girl who was praying and she didn't want to pray for herself. She said, Lord, I'm not going to pray for myself today. I'm going to pray for others. And so she began to pray. And at the end of the prayer, she said, and give my mother a handsome and a rich son-in-law. <laughs> But I'm not going to pray for myself, though. Well, here's something I came across in prayer. This was in the, the little booklet, our, our daily bread, a little devotional booklet. And they gave this thing, the five fingers of prayer. And I thought this was very good. They said, when you fold your hands, the thumb is nearest to you. So begin by praying for those closest to you, your loved ones. The index finger is the pointer. So pray for those who teach, Bible teachers and preachers, those who teach children. The next finger is the tallest. It reminds you to pray for those in authority over you, national and local leaders, and your supervisor at work. Oh, you shouldn't have said that last part. That's your supervisor at work. But you get the follow through here? The fourth finger is usually the weakest. So they say, pray for those who are physically weak, those who are in trouble, or who are suffering. The pinky finger, your little finger, reminds you of your smallness in relation to God's greatness. Ask him to supply your needs. Is that a good way to think about praying? So you pray with your, with your thumb first. What does that represent? Those closest to you. Your first finger? Your pointer, those who teach. Exactly. Next finger, the tallest one. Those in position. By the way, does that mean we're supposed to pray for our new president? Amen. Amen to that. Guys, I mean this sincerely. We need to be praying that God spares his life, yeah. spares his health, so we don't have something worse getting in office. Amen to that. All right. The fourth finger, those who are weak. That's your weakest finger. And the little one Please. represents me to pray for my needs. Why do you think that in this section, Paul lists prayer as such an important part of spiritual warfare? Yeah. Why don't you tell me what you really think, Abby? <laughs> it's the start and end of everything. Right? Yes. That's true. Yeah. But you're talking about all these other pieces of armor that comes on, but the prayer is what activates everything. Prayer is the power behind everything. And so we need to be very careful on this matter. Here's what Jeremy Meyer said. This weapon is something that the enemy does not have, that the enemy cannot stop, that the enemy cannot thwart. There is no defense for this type of weapon. Yeah, I like that. The enemy has no way to come back. All, all the only thing he can do is try to keep you from praying. And he works very good at that. So as we get ready to close on this today, I want to ask you this. What are we going to do about it? You know, we can hear all that the Bible has to say, but what do we do about it? Put it in practice. Put it into practice. We need to pray. Now that all sounds great until it comes down to the point of actually improvising and putting it into effect. What are we going to do to make sure we pray more? Think about the hand. Schedule some time that you put aside to allow for this to take place. 
Schedule some time when you're not distracted with all these other things so your mind can focus clearly on the things of God's Word. I remember reading the story years ago of Susanna Wesley, the father, excuse me, the father, no, she was the mother, that's right, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, the founders of Methodism, the Methodist Church. She had ten children, and they lived in a very small, small house. And she would, she taught her children as she grew up, as they grew up, as she was in her place in the kitchen, she would sit on a certain stool and put her apron up over her head. And the kids knew that when Ma Mama was praying, leave her alone. We don't bother Mama then. You see, we've got to take some activity. We've got to take some kind of steps to prevent that we don't, uh, uh, to make sure that we are able to have time together in prayer. And I think John MacArthur made this statement that I think is so good. He says, we're talking about a life pattern. We're talking about a consciousness of God's presence at all times that leaves my heart fully open to him. That's what this is all about, to be so God conscious that you see and experience everything with reference to him. You see all events in life as related to God. It's that every single thing in your life is something to talk to God about. Everything. Everything. And if we were so involved in prayer this way, then it, be, it becomes every time we, we confront a situation, every time we're involved in a certain matter, we see God in it. Because our hearts have been prepared, our, heart, our hearts have been, been uh, open, sanitized, is the word I was just thinking of. Not for COVID, but sanitized for God. And if we had this kind of prayer life in our, in our lives, how much better it would be. So as we close today, I want to say this. I want us to be praying for our president. Amen. I mean, not just saying God bless him. I'm saying you pray specifically for his health, his character. Pray for advisors that will advise him in a godly manner. And what he does with it after that, of course, is his own thing. Pray for missionaries. And I have to say that I, I, I apologize that I have been somewhat negligent in this whole area, even though we were missionaries for a number of years. The bulletin board in the back on the left, I have put some of the letters from our missionaries. I would encourage you to read those letters and pray for them. In fact, I would challenge you to maybe take one missionary this week, another missionary next week, and pray for those things. Pray, pray, pray for their needs. And let's pray for each other. Wow, what a concept that is. Pray for each other. I have to say that I have to confess that I am negligent in this area. I don't pray for you as often as I should. All of you. So can we agree together we're going to make this a priority in our lives? Yes. We want God's will to be accomplished. And we need to increase and we need to make our prayer life much better than it is today. Father, how we give you praise. And thank you, Father, for your specific teachings concerning the area of prayer. And Father, I would pray that you would just make this something that will be unending. Father, may it not settle down and be at rest in our heart. Father, may it propel us, may it motivate us to take greater strides and to do more things in the area of our prayer life. Father, accept our confession, our, our wrongdoing. Father, we have, been, we have failed to, to pray the way we should. And Father, we ask that you will just help us to overcome this weakness and make this a priority in our lives from this point on. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name and for his sake, we ask it all. Amen.